So I'm going to start off by talking to you a little bit about buzzwords. So there are many, many buzzwords in our, oh, is this? Great, okay. There are many buzzwords in our industry, many of which fuel the, you know, advertising budgets of, of Don Draper at Mad Men or marketing groups that we don't necessarily work with a lot. But just like the big datas and the web components potentially of the world, we have the virtual DOM and functional programming. The virtual DOM has been in pretty much every talk, at least in words that we've heard so far, and I'm sure will be in many more. And functional programming is right now at the bleeding edge of pretty much everything we are thinking about as software engineers. And I want to encourage all of you to take the good, take what we can apply, because even big data, even though now we might roll our eyes or find very funny memes to play with it, Big data does actually have interesting business goals, revenue impacts, and, and some reason to exist in the world, similarly for the virtual DOM and functional programming. And I want to tease apart some of these things for you right now. <laughs> so the virtual DOM is right now, I, at least where I am from in New York, it is a, the biggest hype machine in the world. Vir virtual, everything is basically, talk, everything is virtual DOM. Every framework or library that doesn't use virtual DOM, they say they will use virtual DOM within some amount of fixed days to make sure that you're continuing to talk about it. This is never, it feels like it's never going to go away, but the virtual DOM at its core is not that big of a, or rather, it is a very, it is a very specific solution to a specific problem. What the virtual DOM is, is a performance optimization. I don't know, so by the way, I have a degree in art officially, so I hope that you enjoy my beautifully handwritten slides that I enjoyed preparing for all of you. The, the, the virtual DOM is at its core a, a performance optimization around comparing pieces of DOM very quickly to create the smallest change set in memory that actually needs to update the real DOM. So how many of you have like used jQuery to update DOM most of your life? Okay, I, I'm in this category where jQuery, prototype, dojo, everything else. It was me sitting there twiddling ULs and LIs and things like that to hide or show or add data attributes here and there. <clears throat> what the virtual DOM allows us to do is, at its core, compare two big graphs and as a human, it's pretty hard to tell, but there, there is actually a slight difference here in the bottom left. One node moved from one parent to another one. The virtual DOM allows us to spot these differences quickly, efficiently, and batch update the real DOM very easily. This is what has become the mass and the gross industrial complex of the virtual DOM. Similarly, functional programming. So functional programming, as we heard from Jessica earlier today, has a few main tenets, uh, especially either as a philosophy or a programming paradigm for your day-to-day -day development. Uh, it, it focuses on you know, pure functions, making sure you don't have side effects, some fancy sort of academic terms like referential transparency, which means that you can take any function call in your code and replace it with the value that is produced with that function. Uh, higher order functions, which is also a fancy academic terms, but <coughs> I want to, considering that I have air quotes around functional, I want to break this down much more simply. And I want to bring you back to a time, potentially before I even said the dad joke that makes you think I am old, and I was in Algebra 1. I want you to consider functions like we used to know functions, equations like we used to know equations. What is an equation, or what is this, what is a function as we learned in Algebra 1 at some point a long time ago? It's that thing we see at the top. It is y equals f of x. y equals f of x in this particular beautifully drawn example is an attempt at x squared. And the, the takeaway from a, the learning around what is a function in, you know, ninth grade is really what I want to boil a lot of what functional programming is down to. <clears throat> Given one x, there is one and only one y. This is a lot of what goes into what a pure function really is. Given a specific piece of data to a function or multiple pieces of data to a function, there is only one result. This is something that we don't typically have the luxury of as front-end developers, but thinking in this way allows us to reason about, as you might or might not like the, the usage of the words, code much more easily. So. I don't know if any of you remember that Algebra 1 was a while ago for a lot of us. I 
I was a while ago for me as well. But I remember pretty well being told how to tell if, the, if different graphs are functions. I loved drawing this Cartesian plane thing. I could do the little lines for axes too, but I figured it would, the point is made anyway. Out of this group of different curves, only some of them are functions. And the way that you can tell that they are functions is by the rule of my math teacher in ninth grade, take a pen, move your pen vertically from left to right across your, across your page. <coughs> and if you only hit one point at one time, it is a function. So for example, here, as I move across, I only hit one point vertically at any one given time. This is a function. For example, here, that is not the case. When we are writing code using the functional programming paradigm, considering that every, every input value or group of input values should only output one is very, very helpful for our programming. <clears throat> so I want to take this an example even further back or to another throwback time where it's not necessarily Algebra 1 we're talking about, but it's server-side development and server-side render. Uh, and again, I don't know how many of you remember this, but for a while I was a server-side developer and I made, uh, I made get requests that return HTML. This is a very straightforward, s simple example. We're in, we're in the early 2000s, so everything starts with my. And all we're, all, where we make some get request to a server, that server does some interaction with some database and sends back one beautiful, gigantic string. For a while, that was my entire job, making sure that one gigantic string was correct, that I got to use all of my knowledge that I learned from W3 schools and all the crazy tutorials from back then, and it was great. <clears throat> I managed to make, using the server, pull some stuff from a database and give one canonical gigantic string back to the browser <clears throat> that actually you know, displayed HTML for an end user. <clears throat> this, this thing we see there, we used to, before we were thinking about single page web applications and MVC in the client, we used to call that gigantic string the view. And that's a very different mindset from what we're thinking about now, where <clears throat> the view is either an individual piece of Ember, Angular, Reactor, or Backbone, or something like that. But the goal of a server-side web developer was to make sure that that string, given the current state of the database and the URL, was completely correct. So what was the functional formula for server-side development for a while was very similar to what we think of as a pure function. Given a database and maybe a URL, make some gigantic string of HTML, send that over to the client, and you have your world. This entire world, what we used to call the view, is all the user ever needed it to interact with. It's all they ever needed to read to get whatever information they actually needed. This is the obviously the easy case. We're only just getting something. But so there's a quote from Benjamin Franklin. I don't know if you, there's, it is that, there's nothing sure in life except for death and taxes. For developers, there's a few more things added to this because there's nothing sure in life but death, taxes, bike shedding, over-engineering, a few other things we should all be taking a little bit of pride in, but also change. Nothing is in our life as web developers typically as simple as I write some code, it gets something from a database, and it's done. For example, I'm using an example here as... Um, to do MVC, and using to do MVC, you can, you can add a new item, you type it in, you hit enter, and then boom, your view actually changes. Your view changes in response to the code, the, the, in response to user interaction. So again, in more throwbacks to server side, how did this used to work? This used to work when we were talking about server side web applications by, calling a get, you, um, making a request to a page, typing something into a form, clicking on those beautiful submit buttons that used to be you know, just plain gray and black, didn't have any of these fancy things like bootstrap just yet. That submit button would post back to a server. That server would then update the database, <clears throat> and then instead of sending back whatever gigantic string we eventually want the user to see, a very common pattern was to just redirect the user back to the same page that you could have gotten before. 
And this was so prevalent as a server-side development pattern. It's, it's actually named, called post-redirect get. So how many of you have ever heard of post-redirect get? <clears throat> okay, great. So I pulled, I pulled quite a lot of people in my social circle and colleagues and, and I, people had not heard of this. So what was great about post-redirect get is as a pattern, it allowed us to write your get function as a basically a pure function. The process by which you went to the database and created a gigantic string was exactly the same. You didn't have to reconsider that whenever data was changing. Post-redirect get is actually so popular that it has a gigantic Wikipedia page, in, in case any of you are interested, that I was a little bit surprised by. And it is quite a bit more official with standards and specifications than, uh, than I was expecting. So what this is on the server <clears throat> is very straightforward. It is a single mechanism for taking, taking all of your data, taking the URL you're trying to get, converting that into a gigantic string, and sending that over to the browser. The only inputs to this process are basically your data. But what we live with on the client side in terms of the functions and formulas we have to try to work with, it's not quite so simple. For us as client side developers, with as little tongue in cheek as possible, we have a view that event that gets made out of data. We then try to update that data. We then try really, really hard to keep that data and the view in sync and typically fail, typically fail miserably. I'm in this category, I've never quite gotten it to work. There are dozens, if not hundreds, and I've only put up a few different ways up here, of attempts at trying to make this work. So Backbone has change listeners that you have to remember to silence or else you'll get in a gigantic loop of this changes and then that changes forever. Angular has watchers, Ember has observers. There are so many different mechanisms we have tried to come up with to keep the um, keep our data here in sync. But no matter what, it's always a try. We're never quite successful in every edge case because it is actually immensely difficult as a problem to continue to keep a view that is changing separately and data that is changing separately completely in sync no matter what changes to that data might happen. So in terms of the differences here from server side develop, classic server side development and now client side single page web application de development, the server side in terms of getting something, it is a single step. You get your, the, the server looks at the database, it generates a gigantic string, you're done. That string is exactly the same, it is very predictable. And the client side, there are many different steps, multiple of which could potentially go wrong because you have to define what you're trying to do in many different places. Now this brings me to one of the, I know it seems like I'm so like on the server side here and I hate SBAs and all of this, but I will, I will bring up now the one thing that I really, really miss about pure server side development. And this is related to my favorite, I don't know if all of you have a favorite, I would love to hear about it if you do, my favorite keyboard shortcut. My favorite keyboard shortcut is Control R, Command R. You just refresh, you throw away the whole world. You did some crazy stuff in that console. It made no sense what you did and you got into some weird state. You just Control R that away. It's all fine, it's good, you're back to clean slate, it's amazing. You even hit it like five times like I did in the video just to make really sure. And, and I'm, I'm actually really, and I don't know about, so I don't use Live Reload. Like everyone uses Live Reload now, it's built into everything. I turn it off, so I still have this feeling. I will never get dopamine like this again. I'm telling you. <clears throat> so, so what does so this control R type of clean slatedness is really what we are looking for, and what React allows us to do so much bigger than all of the hype around virtual DOM is it brings back this functional formula that we were able to get from server side web development. Using React, we are basically coming back to a render method. What's that doing? It's basically producing the entirety of the string that was sent back from the server. We're able to consider that our application is, again, given a single piece of data, here is exactly what the view should be looking like at any one given time. And this is amazing with respect to simplicity. React is, as was talked about a few times before, completely predictable. And here I start with the memes, because you know there's no good talk without some memes. 
Uh, React is, is predictable, and given any one piece of data, regardless of how it will change, React gives a completely understandable and predictable mechanism to describe what the view should look like at any one given time. It gives us back that pure, perfect, clean slate that Control-R gave us at one point. And I really love that about React. This is what, aside from all the virtual DOM, this is what brings me to it every time. And what that, for, for me, what that has looked like and what I've been excited about is something that Jessica brought up in her talk, and that's the unidirectional data flow that React pretty much forces you into. Right now, when you develop, you don't have to consider how DOM changes into DOM. All you have to do is fill in, given one gigantic set of data, whether that is sitting in a database somewhere and brought into your front end with JSON, read from disk, however you need to do that, given one set of data, your code in React describes exactly how the DOM should look like given that data. As changes happen to that data, your code continues to do that. You never have to figure out how to transition one into the other. You, all you have to do is say, this is how I want the world to be, not explain how to change the world from one state into another. So this is completely just set it and forget it. And, what, and I have never actually owned one of these things, so I never got to feel the click of the dial like I do when I use React. So I, so when you're, when I'm able, when I'm able to completely write my React application, know that my render methods just do that they need to do, it is basically just setting and forgetting that data ever does change, even though that is one of those guarantees of life, just like death and taxes and all of those other things. So with respect to my own opinions around this unidirectional data flow idea, how React allows you to think about creating web applications as a pure function of your data rather than trying to move view changes in and out of your application, the virtual DOM is still really cool. It is still really interesting. The virtual DOM is, from a performance perspective, what gets us to the stage where this is even feasible. Without the virtual DOM, all of these, the, all of the work that React has done to chain, to uh, diff your virtual DOMs and then update the DOM efficiently would not actually be useful. But I want to, so I don't know how many of you have seen this recent post by CSS Tricks about gzip minification. So there's gzip and minification. gzip is, it's, it's built into the HTTP standard. It is a significant performance savings over using HTTP just to send regular basic ASCII over the wire. gzip in this particular example saves a huge amount more than any particular minification. Gzip is, is another performance optimization that we should be really, really excited about. And maybe we were back in, you know, 1998 or something, whenever the rest of the, the web specifications were coming out. But just like how Gzip is a performance optimization, I want to make a big, hairy, audacious claim here. And I want this, and I, you are all free to tweet this, quote me on this, take pictures, and then yell at me if it doesn't happen at one point. But I will charge all of you to make sure that it does. In 2016, freaking out about the virtual DOM in React will be exactly equivalent to freaking out about gzip right now. Maybe, maybe we, you know, it's really cool how gzip does all of these great things. But when is the last time you went, you went to a talk about how great gzip was in HTTP? It's really cool. It's really interesting. But it's not necessarily what changes the paradigm. What changes the paradigm is being able to consider your React application with unidirectional data flow to be a pure function of your data. The virtual DOM is a great performance optimization, but it is just a performance optimization. What this originally came from is in terms of my own frustrations, so I run a meetup in New York, NYC HTML5. If any of you are ever there, I might make you speak there, so let me know if you're in New York. Um, and there, well, I had, I had two, three talks on Re uh, that had either on React or unrelated to React, and all three talks including one on Ember and one on SVG, which is, I guess, somewhat related, all talked about virtual DOM completely out of nowhere. So please take this with you. The virtual DOM is awesome. Considering your applications as a pure function of your data is much, much better. Uh, so I'm John Paul. You can feel free to follow me, email me. 
I would love to answer any questions either at lunch or afterward. Uh, my, my beautiful art degree, please have a great lunch. Thank you so much, organizers, sponsors, I appreciate it.